so um, can I talk about why we need a paradigm shift in mobility planning? Um, a lot of reasons we already heard before. I'll, I'll add a few and I'll also try to add some solutions from my personal perspective. Uh, I'm, as the title suggests, have uh, working a lot in planning. I've done this in Europe. I worked um, 14 years for a consultancy in Cologne and on European projects. Worked for Ruprecht Consult there. Um, before moving to the US, um, as Madulika said, I work for GPI. Now it's an um, engineering company. I'm their director of sustainability. Um, engineering and planning company. So um, have, um, as, as she said, around for over 50 years. Um, you see the you see the uh, the spots there where we are located. It's, we're mainly operating in the U.S., but do some international projects as well. Um, fairly large company, 1,500, but not one of the really really big engineering firms. So still small, still family-like, and what's really nice is we're 100% employee-owned. So just a little bit of background here. But uh, let me jump into the um, into the presentation. So. Transport and mobility, um, we heard it before. So transport is about um, keeping people and goods moving. We, I agree with Stephanie that we often forget uh, the, about the movement of goods. Um, um, that, that should not be, we have, it's, it's a major aspect of, um, you know, uh, looking at transport and, and sustainable transport, especially. Uh, the difference, transport and mobility, in my view, um, and it was also touched up on before, um, we're providing, with mobility, when we talk about mobility, we provide, uh, we're talking about access of, from, uh, of people to jobs, to uh, healthcare, to education, to basically all the uh, necessary functions that society offers. So that is, that is the major difference. The, all the good parts of, of transport and mobility come with a, uh, with a big price. We know this, uh, we, we touched on this, from congestion to air pollution. Um, it can actually make us, make us sick. Uh, we can get killed in, on the road. Uh, and um, but Sima talked about very um, eloquently about uh, the uh, transport equity issues. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add to this. I, I wish I had uh, done an extra slide here. I think, I, I think this is so important um, to, to, to address as a topic here, especially when we talk about uh, obviously inclusive mobility, which SIGMI does. So let me just jump in here. Traffic congestion uh, and its cost to society. So I'm gonna come up with some, tell you about some, some figures here. I have, I have not, a lot of numbers from the US, uh, but they, they may be similar in other countries. The, uh, the cost of, of traffic congestion, um, and there was research done just a few years ago, they amount to $124 billion per year in direct and indirect costs. So um, whatever you spend in, um, and time wasted, fuel wasted, the effects on the uh, um, uh, on the environment through congestion, but also the the costs that are passed on to to consumers. That amounts to 124 billion per year. That it's a strange number, doesn't mean so much, but that's actually one dollar per person per day. So that that puts it into into perspective. We had uh, moving down the list here. We had heard about uh, that transport is is uh, has become the uh, top source in terms of sectors for climate change. So we can really, you know, um, it just shows how important this sector is in, in, in making, making changes. We talked before about maritime traffic, air traffic maybe uh, also. I'm, I'm gonna focus a lot in this presentation on uh, passenger uh, uh, transport, trans uh, passenger mobility. So, and and cities. Stephanie mentioned that the cities are the battlegrounds um, of our time to address climate change, and I completely agree. So, a lot of my points will be about urban mobility here. Uh, that being said, um, 
uh, traffic, of course, produces a lot of um, problems in terms of air, air pollution. You have here, you see that the um, urban materials, they have up to 120% more uh, air pollution concentrations than local roads. Uh, so that makes, that makes, us, uh, makes us sick. Um, what also makes us sick is the inadequate level of physical activity. We have developed a transportation system that is so dependent on the car and the automobile that people don't move the way they should do uh, in terms of uh, recommended physical activity. And actually the, the lack of physical activity is, is, is associated with um, premature death. So you can, um, one in eight cases of breast cancer could be avoided with more activity. One in eight cases of colorectal cancer, one in 12 cases of diabetes, and one in 15 cases of heart disease. Um, so that is that is pretty alarming in, in terms of figures. What is possibly even more alarming um, or more dramatic, I should say, is, is the road fatalities. So the World Health Organization um, regularly does um, reports and, and, and uh, collects and gathers and analyzes data. So in 2018, we had reached 1.35 million road fatalities per year. Again, an almost incomprehensible number, uh, but this is 3,700 people per day worldwide. So now that we all talk about the pandemic, um, I looked this up, it was Tuesday that we had 11,700 people die of uh, the coronavirus. And every day we have 3,700 and, and road uh, fatalities uh, and the uh, the screams for help are not there uh, as far as I can hear, um, not as much as they probably should be. So there are differences across across the globe, uh, obviously. So we have up to uh, I think um, Liberia and Namibia; those are um, the worst, unfortunately, uh, in terms of fatalities. They reach up to 35 fatalities per 100,000 people per year. In the US, we have 11, uh, Germany 3, 3.2, Sweden, which is probably one of the best, um, and I'll talk about that later, about their efforts, 2.3 people out of 100,000 uh, uh, die on, on the roads. So, I'd like to add to the uh, to the great presentation there from from Sima about inclusion and especially uh, the gender issue. Uh, I, I just have numbers from New York City, so um, I believe she uh, she said ninety four percent of 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 women in Bangladesh or maybe it was Dhaka uh, had experienced ninety four uh, had experienced sexual harassment in in, in transit, which is is unbelievable. It's, um, uh, it's of course unacceptable. But uh, in New York City, it's seventy-five percent of women who have experienced harassment or theft, uh, theft on in public transport. It's only forty-seven percent of men. Uh, Twenty-nine percent of women say they don't take public transit because of experience of harassment. Eight percent in comparison for men, and forty-two percent of women feel safer. Uh, using taxis, Uber, Lyft, uh, then uh, public transit. So I don't know if you heard about uh, the pink tax. So in my, my research, I discovered this. The pink tax is actually the extra expenses that women spend on, you know, just using and participating in the transport system, getting from A to B. So um, research actually shows that women in New York City spend up to $1,200 more than men each year on transport. And that's referred to as the pink tax. Uh, last point here is about, is again about transportation equity. Uh, figure from America here, 24% of Americans live in poverty with no car. And as I said, as I said before, um, it's all about access to jobs. So that is, they, there's obviously a limited um, access to job, opportuni uh, job opportunities, to education, to healthcare, and so forth. And it's also an issue of, of safety, again, considering that 
most of the underserved community members, uh, they don't work nine to five, uh, uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. shifts. Uh, they they have to to move around transport in the, in the dark uh, sometimes or more often. Uh, they're more likely to travel by bike. They're more likely to walk on roads, lacking safe and accessible facilities. So they are much more ex exposed and vulnerable. So those are all issues that make our transportation system unsustainable at the moment. And a large, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious. For the last decades, we had overemphasized uh, planning uh, on the automobile. Um, and all that came in with this. I have here congestion in Mexico. Where we have pictures all over the world that, that look like this. We have created a car dominant and, and car dependent society. And to make things work worse, the um, traffic actually induces more traffic. This is perhaps a funny, funny illustration of how a lot of people feel, especially, um, I, I guess, I mean, I, I work in the global north, but um, just, just uh, looking around here in, in the US where I live near New York, people don't like to ha let their kids uh, walk to, to school, cycle to school, things that they, they did uh, as parents, maybe 30 years themselves, it's no longer safe because there's so much traffic. So as this little cartoon says, um, there's so much traffic um, for Billy to walk to school. So we drive him. It's, that, that's just, it's crazy, but traffic is inducing more traffic. And so is building more, uh, more roads. So just adding um, lanes, traffic lanes, they're filled quickly. Uh, induced traffic, uh, just it just fills up. Um, so this unfortunately is a is a picture, a very recent picture, um, featured in the Economist just last month uh, in Cairo, where they are apparently building uh, vast uh, expressways right through the residential areas, cutting through urban space uh, in ways that. We thought we wouldn't see anymore, but this is this is still a uh, uh, picture from from 2020. So, what can we do? I I'm putting I'm I'm trying to show you, I will show you some some concepts. As I said, I, I work in, in planning. I worked in in Europe. I've worked in the U.S. Also in the UN contexts. So. Planning towards sustainability, I'm going to show you um, a concept, sustainable mobility plans that has made its way around the world. Complete streets is a, is a policy and, and, and design concept from the US. Healthy streets is from London, UK. And Vision Zero, a lot of people may have heard that before, is from, from Sweden. It's not new, it was developed and uh, put into action in 1994 already but still uh, a very timely issue. So let me talk about sustainable urban mobility plans. The most important part of the slide you see on the bottom, it's, it's called the planning for people. It's actually the slogan of this, of this concept, um, which was promoted by the European Commission as a way to uh, provide a more sustainable path of transportation and uh, for our transportation systems to to address the climate uh, uh, change crisis and to have a more participatory approach to to planning so this is this is what it's about it's planning for people um, the, the project, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a, in a minute, but it's actually European policy since 2013. Uh, it has seen uh, one iteration now. The guidelines have been updated. I encourage everybody who's interested to look at ELTIS.org. That's the European Urban Mobility Observatory of the European Commission. Interesting part here is that municipalities all over Europe are encouraged to develop such, an S, uh, such a plan called SUMP uh, and a good quality one. Uh, the, 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 one of the incentives, uh, in addition to just doing the right thing, is that transportation infrastructure 
funding by the Commission, uh, European Commission, and by uh, some you know, multilateral banks is linked to the existence of such an SUMP, which is great. And it it's, it's not just in, in the EU, it's, it's uh, in the accession countries of the EU. Um, it's actually uh, via GIZ and uh, French development agencies and others uh, making its way to South America, Africa, and Asia. So what is, what is it all about? Um, this is the paradigm shift in urban mobility planning. I hope you can see it. On the left side, it's uh, clearly, I mean, it's, it's uh, on the left side, you have the traditional transportation planning and on the right, the sustainable mobility planning concept. So the main difference on the top, while well, we traditionally planned for traffic and the automobile, and traffic flow capacity, so just make, making cars move as fluently as possible and, 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 and uh, desired speed, we're moving away from that with the SUMP concept towards focusing on people and their accessibility to services um, a, a city has to offer and, and ultimately their, their quality of life. Hence also the, 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 the slogan of this, this concept being planning for people. Um, the, I want to highlight this, this element here. We're looking at the really multimodal uh, concept here, not a monomodal uh, one just for the car. Stephanie had, had mentioned multimodality here. Um, just showing you one slide, you may have seen this one before, the mobility permit. Um, it's an upside down pyramid. So we have the most sustainable modes on the top. Uh, walking in terms of sustainability, in terms of emissions and so forth, um, followed by cycling and, and new modes like micro mobility, shared modes, public transport. Um, on, the, on, the, on the very bottom, you have the private um, automobile, the single occupied vehicle. I'm going to ignore the plane for, for the moment here. Obviously, we cannot move longer distance, but distances by just walking. So. In my view, this is, um, it's, it's, it's all about a balanced approach. So not, not, well, not in, in a war against the car. Uh, maybe some people wish to think this way, but uh, in my view, it's a balanced development. Um, we will still rely for the foreseeable time on the, on the automobile, but not to the extent as done before. And the, the focus of planning should really be on the sustainable modes especially on the active transportation modes, which I understand, uh, not just me, but uh, it, it's, it's commonly understood as walking, cycling, and public transit, because um, in order to use transit, you are actually walking, in some cases, and be able to cycle to, to transit, um, talking about last mile and all this. Coming back to this, this table, other as important aspects of, of the concepts, um, and I'm just going to pick out the bottom two here, the involvement of stakeholders and citizens. So when uh, SIGMI was introduced this morning, it was, it was said it's a bottom-up and human-centric um, initiative. Uh, SUMP is just that. It's bottom-up in terms of a participatory approach. It's human centric. It really engages people, creates ownership of a plan, gets the views of people, um, and implements uh, in, in priority the sustainable modes. So, the, creating this ownership is, is crucial in the concept. Uh, another one that I want to mention is evaluation. So, when we heard before, we need more data, especially in the global south. Yes, we also need more, not. Yeah, we need more data in the global north as well. We need different data. So we, are, we need much more uh, qualitative indicators that, that look into, you know, how can I capture progress in, in terms of creating inclusion? How can I capture progress in terms of creating active uh, transportation or mobility options? So it's a lot about perceptions, about how people feel um, 
and and how they see things and that that's very important here i'll talk a bit later about that when i talk about healthy streets this is another important slide for the sump concept just the eight principles of it um, you can you can have a look on the website uh, if you want to go into detail here uh, just a couple points that i want to point out one the principle one here, the functional urban area, you cannot just plan for uh, the inner city that, that, that's defined by administrative borders. You have to plan uh, for the functional city defined by where people live, how do they commute from the urban core to the outside and back. So that's really the focus. So it's, it's more like a, a metropolitan approach um, that, that is suggested here. And also the second one I want to hi uh, highlight um, the institutional boundaries. So we need to work not just geographically uh, across across administrative borders, but across sectors. So when um, when Seema said how, how how many disciplines are involved in in mobility planning before, she's absolutely right. We need to talk about transport engineers talking to land use planners, to health experts, uh, to educators, law enforcement. So they are all conceptually and uh, uh, combined uh, as stakeholders in, in this concept. This is um, actually a list of awards and I put this up here to, to show you um, if you're interested um, to, to go into best practices. You see the various topics uh, that, that um, the European Commission uh, focused on each year. So it goes, it started off with the most important one, the participatory approach, Aberdeen won this. And you see the other topics there. We, it was addressed, urban freight, uh, Brussels won. And, uh, you know, safe walking and cycling, that's Brussels capital region one also. We, you have uh, shared mobility in Tourda, Romania. So the picture is from that too various topics and 2020 is not announced yet but this is about climate change zero emissions mobility for all so have a look at the website you can get uh, get the best practices there moving on um focus on streets streets used to be <laughs> much different than than most of the streets that we experience now there used to be places of social interaction uh, among neighbors, um, playgrounds for children, and uh, sometimes ecological spaces. Uh, so that's in a lot of cases gone, and we feel more like this picture shows um, very narrow space for people actually. Um, you know, the big black hole being reserved for the for the, the space for the for the automobile and leaving very uh, narrow paths for, for human interaction and mobility. So while well, we feel like that, we maybe want to uh, have it look more like this, a car oriented street versus a multimodal street. I put this up because uh, as I said, I work for an engineering company. There's a lot that can be done. Um, Stephanie mentioned that infrastructure is long term and it takes takes a lot of time i like to disagree a little bit you can do a lot of infrastructure changes immediately uh, with relatively quick turnaround and and quick benefits um, attractive for politicians to see um, within their uh, election cycle so this is left compared to right um, of course, we're looking at moving people, not cars. Uh, so don't look at the actual figures too much uh, in, in, in terms of capacity of how many people you can, you can move, but you get the picture. It's, it's substantially more in this case, about two and a half times more people can be moved on a multimodal street compared to a car oriented street. And that just in terms of infrastructure by, um, gaining back space that that was allocated to the to the automobile back to um to, to pedestrians wider sidewalks uh taking away some parking uh adding 
cycle lanes. Ideally, they are protected cycle lanes to make it safe. Um, you have a dedicated bus lane here, BIT. Um, sorry to hear in that it, that didn't materialize in Taka. Um, still believe in many places in the global south uh, uh, the way to go like, uh, to to move the masses of people. And um, there's also some elements of, of green infrastructure. So you actually have on the right side some some trees, or you can have some some other greenery there. Um, so that's just a completely different uh, look of a street, a more uh, human centric uh, uh, street. So I'll, I'll talk about some about the uh, complete streets approach in the United States. It's it's around for a little for, for a while, almost two decades now, um, and implemented in many places around the U.S. I'll show you some examples. A lot of smaller places uh, also, because um, as you see in the caption of this photo, smart growth online from the example here in North Carolina, the the design of a complete street is com sorry complete street is often linked to um, economic development, downtown revitalization, uh, and things like that. Just realizing that people want to have an attractive environment to shop, uh, one that actually, often looking at Europe, also allows them to stroll and you know just enjoy themselves a little more, um, has become very apparent in the times of the pandemic that you know people walk more, they they cycle more, but they need the space to distance. So we've seen this in the US a lot now that I think the same in, in Europe. I haven't been there since the pandemic, but you know, um, parklets are created, space, uh, parking space is converted to public space, uh, sidewalks or even sitting areas. So uh, just in general, Complete Streets is about creating a safe street for people of all ages and abilities. I think it's very important. Uh, we talk about, um, the streets for for usable for children and and uh, all the way to to the elderly so the 8 to 80 uh, street if you like all abilities so whether you're you're uh, mobility impaired um, or you have um, sort of handicap you're just slower that that is taken into account here um, it also takes into account uh, gender uh, so I think the infrastructure has a lot uh, of opportunities to address the the um, the, in the inequities uh, um, that exist, especially for for women, just to feel secure in the in the way um, you use the street. You maybe wait for 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 a bus or a train. Just simple light light uh, lights can make a difference. Um, or shelter, things like that. And also this approach is about the balanced needs of, of different transportation modes. So again, it's not about completely banning the car, but to, to find a, a reasonable compromise between all the modes um, that we use to, to move around. <clears throat> it is about context. So the streets are different. Um, very different, as you see, um, or as illustrated here in the picture, if you're in the countryside or if you're in suburbia or in uh, uh, in the inner city. So there are different solutions um, and they offer you different uh, possibilities in terms of, of infrastructure. Again, this picture shows what's possible. I, I added this here to just show you there are planting strips on the, the second to right and green spaces. So. We, uh, in practice here uh, at GPI, we use this to uh, introduce green infrastructure uh, and combine it with, with uh, more traditional transportation design solutions. So that, that's a really nice way to create an attractive uh, a street and, and, and urban environment. Some examples, not necessarily complete streets, but probably the most famous example, since I'm talking uh, from New York, Times Square here and um, how it how it transformed. I think transformation was the other big uh, buzzword. I I I, I remembered from from the introduction of Sydney. 
Um, and this quote is just perfectly fitting it all. I think um, it's true. If you plan for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. If you plan for people and places, you get people and places. Um, so very true, said by Fred Kent, um, Project for Public Spaces. Um, obviously, a plan is just a plan. You need to implement it. But uh, things like this have been implemented almost overnight. Uh, this was a tactical urbanism measure, initially planned as a as a temporary solution. Um, I think Stephanie mentioned the, uh, that she cycled along the this beautiful road in Berlin, and she mentioned that it was temporary. What typically happens, or what we hope that happens when we do things like this, uh, is that people like it so much um, that they insist that it becomes permanent. You know, it makes it hard on politicians to say, okay, I'm gonna go back now, but no, people love it. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make this permanent. So this is actually what happened here in Times Square. There are other examples. So this is just a complete streets example from, uh, from Brooklyn. You see the green infrastructure in the middle. Another example, this is Canada. Um, again, a, a tactical urbanism measure, something temporary becomes becomes permanent. Uh, this is an example of a small place that uh, my company actually worked on. So just making the point is this is for villages just as much as it is for the mega cities. And here you see the, the practical solution and um, a space where somebody was actually killed before it. Um, you narrow the street through street design. Um, just by narrowing it, reducing the tendency, people's tendency to speed. And obviously you have uh, warning signs here and um, uh, just reduce the chances of, of people getting injured or even, even killed. Um, and also in terms of equity, um, it doesn't, you know, bringing in the, the, the sidewalk into the street, just the crossing distance and the crossing time is much shorter. So it makes it much more likely to for people of, of all abilities to cross. Healthy streets. Frank, I a, just I'm as a yeah. as, as a timekeeper. I just yeah, have I'll, I'll, I have like three you. more slides. Okay. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll come to an end. So I wanted to mention healthy streets uh, for London. Very important as a as an example to to link transport with public health. That's done in in London, and uh, as you. Stephanie had the model split example up. A lot of people already walk, not so many people cycle in, in, in uh, London, but this is about to change. At least they're working very hard on it. The, the important thing here is linking transport with health. Um, indicators, very, very interesting indicators. I encourage everybody to look at them. Uh, qualitative, uh, about a lot of about perceptions, how people feel in terms of uh, safety, security, uh, enjoying the street and so forth. So that's worth a look. I'm gonna skip through a little quicker here. Vision Zero is the concept of um, from Sweden. But um, I like this slide because, you know, we, we pretty much know what, what to do. We need to reduce speed. We need to, um, you know, maybe help with transportation infrastructure. But before we really act, um, oftentimes, bad things have to happen. Uh, so that may not be, hopefully is not necessary because we just, you know, do, to do the right thing, uh, Vision Zero um, put, a, put a framework in place in Sweden that was so successful. It's they have the fewest fatalities in, in Europe and across the world just by combining road infrastructure planning and design, uh, vehicle technology improvements, education and also um, enforcement. And the example shows, again, uh, it was picked up in, in New York and many other places as, as a concept, but really highlighting that road safety is such an important issue around the world. Final slide here, I believe the drivers of change, um, I'm summarizing them here, planning for people and their quality of life, uh, bottom-up approaches. I think the topics that that are that are driving the change are health and safety concerns, uh, also security. I think it's it's very important, especially after hearing Seema's uh, 
presentation, I would, I would like to, to cooperate there a little more. I think it's important for men actually to talk about inclusion and gender issues. Um, not if I may say it, just women. Uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, men need to talk about this. And, you know, you, you see the other points there. Uh, in the in the terms of the time, I'm just going to finish here. See my contact information if you want to get in touch. But I'm happy to answer questions tonight.